the keto world basically said, if you're not eating carbs, you're going to feel good. You're going to have endless amounts of energy and all of this is going to be amazing. And I never had that. Dopamine is not about the pursuit of happiness. It is about the happiness of pursuit. Because if we apply protocols to nutrition, we see a lot of problems there. And that was one of the big things that Ray Pete was adamant about, was that nutrition and health is not a protocol-based checklist that people follow. Oh, you are a special snowflake. <laughs> because in this world... I'm not a snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Recommended Daily Value. I'm your host, Tyler Woodward. And in today's episode, I had the pleasure of interviewing Brian Thomas, or as he's known online, Performance Neuro. Brian is a personal trainer by trade, but his real passion is in neuroscience and the integration of nutrition, fitness, and neuroscience. And that's really what we dive into today, how you can train your brain using your body, using neuroscience, and also how nutrition integrates into this picture of both health, performance, and fitness. So I think it's a really interesting conversation, and I will see you guys in there. Brian Thomas, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. No problem. Thank you for taking the time and coming on. I really appreciate it. So we are both kind of coming from the Ray P. I know you have a background in personal training and fitness as well, but how did Brian Thomas become Brian Thomas that is today? Oh, well, that's a, it's a long question, but uh, <laughs> I, I got into Ray P. stuff and part of my fitness journey because years ago I was uh, heavily entrenched in the low carb world. I was doing a lot of the paleo and intermittent fasting and Everyone promised me that I was going to feel better doing all that stuff. And I kept not feeling better. So I, of course, at the time did what everyone does when they're trying to pursue health goals is I went to the extreme. So I went from low carb to keto and then still didn't feel better. So I went from keto to keto plus fasting. And then I went from keto plus fasting to all of that and cold thermogenesis. And I started following the work of a guy named Jack Cruz. And if anyone's not familiar with Jack Cruz, I'm not recommending you go look at his stuff by any stretch, uh, because at that point, I was at the lowest in my health journey at the time. But mentally, I was so locked into this idea, these promises of feeling better, that I followed all of his advice, which was really high levels of fish oil, going out in the cold, taking cold baths all the time. And he talked a big game and was super complex in his explanations. and I didn't understand most of it. But at one point, he had an article where he said something to the effect of, this is what the Ray Pete people get wrong. And I remember thinking to myself, well, who's this Ray Pete guy he just mentioned? So I went online, I found Ray Pete's website, and I looked it up, and I remember reading an article of his, and it talked about serotonin and sugar, and I was like, well, this guy's obviously nuts. Mm -hmm. So I just ignored it. I ignored Ray Pete altogether, and went back to doing my low-carb stuff, because that was what everyone was talking about at the time. And still didn't get any better, still felt awful. And at this point, I was looking at progressing my career in the fitness industry. And part of the fitness industry is that you get continually educated on different aspects of things, depending on the certifications you have. And one of the classes I took, I was looking at doing a kettlebell certification. And I sought out somebody who had kettlebell experience, had some of the kettlebell certifications I was looking at acquiring myself. And in that process, they want you to take a physical testing component. You go to the course, you have to do so many snatches in a certain amount of time. So it's a very physically grueling weekend of education and movement. And so I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to get injured in acquiring this certification and training for it. Sought him out. We went through this whole process of checking my movements. He said, everything's great, except we got to a Turkish getup which if you aren't familiar with the Turkish getup, I'm basically lying on my back with a kettlebell lifted over my head. And I have to stand up while keeping the kettlebell overhead the whole time. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty complex movement. And in one of the phases of that movement, there's a bit of a bridging of my hips. The guy looks at me and says, can you get your hips any higher? I said, no, that's, that's all I got. And so he grabbed my foot and he stretched my foot out. And I thought, oh, this is weird. And this guy's got like a foot fetish or something. But I didn't want to be rude. So I'm like, all right, whatever. So I go, he's like, now retry your Turkish getup. So I go back down on the ground. I go through the motion again. And all of a sudden, my hip bridge was way easier, way stronger. My hips just shoot through the ceiling. It was just unbelievably different. And at that point, I'm like, well, that's weird. What, what happened here? And he said, okay, we talked about strong first. We talked about the RKC, both of which are kettlebell certifications. He's like, now let's talk about Z-Health. 
Z Health is an education company that teaches people about how the brain works in regards to movement and performance. So at that point, I was totally just blown away by the response I had from something as simple as him moving my foot and how that changed my entire movement skill. And so at that point, I just said, forget kettlebell stuff. I want to go take those courses. So I went to a Z Health course, and I remember at this point, I was still low carb, and I thought I knew everything. I thought ketones were the brain's preferred fuel source. They were the bee's knees of your bioenergetic <laughs> function. And I go to this course, and I remember seeing the instructors of this course. They were fantastic movers. They moved so well, and everything that they demonstrated and everything that they did. And the big thing, too, that stuck out to me was they were very relaxed and calm. And at this point in my life, I was anxious. I was stressed all the time. My sleep was terrible. Everything about who I, how I felt about myself and who I was, I did not like. And so seeing that and seeing how they moved, seeing how they interacted with the world and seeing how they ate at this course, I mean, they would come in and they'd be drinking coffee, which everyone said is, oh, you can't have coffee. Coffee's bad for you. They would have sugar. They would have fruit. They would have all of this stuff that at the time I thought you could never have because there's carbohydrates there. There's sugar in there. And lo and behold, they were basically embodying every quality that I did not have that I wanted. And so then I said, okay, I need to think about this a little bit differently. And then sure enough, get to talking to some of them and Ray Pete was their uh, inspiration for some of their nutritional decisions. And I followed some of the other Z Health practitioners around for a while, saw how they ate, and it inspired me to give sugar a try. So the one day I finally caved to all of these sugar cravings I was trying to suppress for so long, I remember sleeping better than I ever slept, at least in the last five, six, seven years. I remember waking up and I had, at this point, uh, a morning erection, which was non-existent for me at that time. That was not a function in my life. And I remember thinking, okay, this is weird. How come I'm feeling better than I've felt in a long time doing the exact opposite of what all of these mainstream sources have told me to do? And at that point, I said, okay, I need to give this Ray P guy a serious look. I need to understand what's going on here because... This is different, and this is exactly what I want. And so, lo and behold, it worked out perfectly because following his advice, every problem I had on the low carb side of things went away. Every single one. Well, except for my hair, that never came back. <laughs> I'm not too concerned about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, going back to your keto days, how, and I, I was never into low carb, but I was big into fasting. And, you know, you think in the moment, at least I did, that you feel great, you feel very energized. It's just a different type of energy that you have now. How would you compare and contrast, you know, your peak keto days, how you felt compared to now? I think in my peak keto days, a lot of what I would describe as feeling good was more a sense of feeling like I was adhering to a model. It was a sense of accomplishment of saying, these are the rules that were bestowed upon me by the fasting and keto gods. And when I followed those rules, I felt like I was doing the right thing. And therefore, I conflated that feeling with actually feeling good. And so compared to where I'm at now, the feelings I have now energetically are far different. And knowing things like how to take my pulse and temperature, knowing things about how thyroid affects people, knowing things about how I can actually see an individualized response to what I do. That was very different than in the keto world. The keto world basically said, if you're not eating carbs, you're going to feel good. You're going to have endless amounts of energy and all of this is going to be amazing. And I never had that. I never had this endless amount of energy. I had this persistent sense of trying to stay busy. I had this persistent anxiousness about my day, but it was never a... Oh, I feel energetic. And in the pro-metabolic side of things, as I've gotten into a more repeat uh, approach to my nutrition, what I've realized is that when things are dialed in for me, when I have the right nutrition, when I have the right training, when I have the right uh, combination on the lock, so to speak, I feel very relaxed. I feel very warm. I feel very focused. And most importantly of all, my jokes land a lot better. <laughs> I have a much better sense of humor. I have a much better uh, relaxed 
approach to life. And that was a big difference. Comparatively to the keto days, I didn't ever have that. It was always, oh, I have to be worried about every little thing. I can't go out to any family functions because there's going to be carbs there. I can't go out and eat at a restaurant because there's going to be carbs there. And if I order anything at a restaurant, it's going to be the most fat-laden, protein-laden meal there is. And I can't have chips and salsa because, heaven forbid, I get a carbohydrate. It'll bump me right out of ketosis. And there's my whole week of work getting into ketosis again down the drain. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a lot more relaxing to do things this way, for one. But for two, when things are lined up right and I'm in the right a bioenergetic space, everything just feels better. Yeah. The way I would kind of describe it, at least in my experience, was you do feel energized or I didn't feel energized, but it's a very different type of energy where you're always a second away from snapping. And mm -hmm. You are like if someone even I was deep and so I was, you know, working out, then I was landscaping and then I was finally coming home after like 10 hours and eating dinner. And if you even tried to say intermittent fasting wasn't good for you, I was immediately up, up right up you with my autophagy. Yes. Uh, evidence <laughs> that I hadn't read, just had parroted from somebody else. Right. And then but, all the lean gains, Martin Burkans kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. 16, <laughs> eight, you need time to digest yourself, let your cells recover, yada, 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 all that great stuff. Um, so you dove into Z health. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what Z health is and does and what you're doing now? Yeah. So Z health is first and foremost, a health based system. People hear the term Z Health and the, the name of the company is Z Health Performance. So the word Z, the letter Z in there actually stands for the Russian word for health, which is Zdrovia. So the name actually translates to health, health performance, which means health is so important it's in the name twice. And when it comes to how your brain actually affects all of these systems about health, if we think about what your hypothalamus does, your hypothalamus lives in the brain. It's a brain structure that governs hormone function. It governs hormone function based on how your brain is perceiving the world around you. So what Z Health does is it teaches you first and foremost how to move in a way that gives your brain the information it needs to feel safe in the world. So not all movement is good for you. So that's a myth that we often hear is exercise is good for you. Just do exercise and you're going to be healthy. But if you're doing a movement that your brain does not feel good about, doesn't feel like it's a safe movement, doesn't feel like it's a movement that it wants you to do, the hormonal response is going to reflect that. You're going to see an increase in blood pressure. You're going to see an increase in sympathetic tone. You're going to see a change in how your brain is going to respond to that situation. And then furthermore, you're going to see changes in things like heart rate, muscle tone will change, flexibility will change, coordination will change. This can also show up in how it affects things like cognition, your focus, your ability to hold attention on a task. All of that is going to be a reflection of your brain function. And so when it comes to what Z Health teaches, Z Health teaches you how to assess that, how to change that, and how to really hyper individualize all training and movement to give the brain of that individual in front of you the information that it needs. Because if I just say, Tyler, you and I are going to do the same workout. We go to the gym, you get on the leg press, I get on the leg press. You might have a fantastic response to that. And my brain might say, this is terrible. I'm going to give you pain. I'm going to give you lack of movement. And then you're going to be stiff and miserable for the rest of the day. And I'm not even going to give you the energy to go through the rest of your workout, Brian, because for you, Brian, that's not a good, safe movement pattern where you might do it and say, I feel amazing. after." Mm. You're going to get a huge body high. You're going to be like, I love it. I can't wait to come back and do leg day again. I'm going to do that same workout the same way because it just feels so good when I do it. You and I could have two very drastically different responses to the same exact stimulus because we have two very drastically different brains. Okay. And so if we don't acknowledge that, then you and I doing the same thing could net a different response. There was a uh, paper, I think it was 2016, maybe it was 2013, 2014, somewhere in the early 2000s. We'll say that. It's kind of weird to say now. It kind of makes me sound old. Hmm. But what they found is they compared different responses to a training program. They gave a whole group of people the same training program. And what they found was that about 30% of people 
either had no response or a negative response to the training program. And some people had a really good, strong, positive response. And what they basically concluded from this is that not all people respond the same way to the same response. And so it's very, very tempting for us to say, go work out, go eat right, go move, go exercise, go lift weights, go do these things. But not everybody gets the same response to that. And there's lots of reasons for that. But if we don't look for those uh, reasons, if we don't adjust people's training based on those reasons, then a lot of people are going to spend their time spinning their wheels in the gym, hoping to get better and feel awful, maybe get worse, maybe get nowhere. And then they're going to hate exercise. They're going to get down on themselves. And there's a reason for it. But if we don't accept that the, uh, that training needs to be adjusted for that person, it's very, very easy for people to become disenfranchised with fitness. And that's unfortunate. Absolutely. So do you think there are unanimously bad exercises or is it going to depend on the person and like, you know, the place and time in which they can do the exercise? So, you know, you might be not able to do a leg press today, but we do certain things to make this leg press more, let's say, accessible to you. And then down the line, it could be. Yeah, I think that there are not necessarily, I think the, the universal negative exercises, the universally problematic exercises, I think that's far more of a myth than the fitness industry tends to make things out. So one of the big boogeymen in uh, the fitness world is spinal movement. You're not supposed to move your spine. You can't bend your spine or extend your spine because you have a limited number of those in your life. And if you do that, then eventually you're going to wear your spine out. This is the Stuart McGill model of spinal function and back pain. Unfortunately, a lot of Stuart McGill's research was done on pig cadavers. And if you would know anything about movement and physics and human physiology, A, you are not a pig and B, you are a living organism. So when you take a pig spine and you put it in this device and you move it back and forth again and again and again and again, well, yeah, you're going to wear it down because it's dead tissue. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not going to heal. It's not going to repair. It's not going to adapt. And so if where I'm at in my own structural anatomy is that there are certain anatomical limitations to my movement, your hip capsule versus my hip capsule could affect my squat depth or yours could affect your deadlift predisposition versus mine. You might be better at sumo because of your hip anatomy. I might be better at conventional. Or maybe I'm better at sprinting and you're better at squatting. Mm -hmm. Whatever it might be, those anatomical things have to be considered as well. So not everybody is built for every exercise. And then from a neurological standpoint, certain movements might be deemed, I'm going to use this term, threatening to the brain. So let's say doing a deadlift. In the act of doing a deadlift, I have to bend forward into a hip hinge position. If I think just purely biomechanically, I'm thinking about the musculature and the, maybe the skeletal structure of all of the pieces involved with that. If I think neurologically, now I'm thinking about all of the systems that are controlling the muscle tone. So the flexibility of the hamstring to allow me to bend down is regulated in part by the nervous system. Yeah, there's going to be limitations like the ligaments and the tissue itself and the hip capsule and the anatomical structures. Uh, but the amount of muscle tone being sent to the hamstring itself is governed by signals coming from the brain. So if the brain says, we don't want you to bend forward because every time you bend forward, well, now you change your orientation towards gravity. Your inner ear now kicks in and says, wait a minute, we don't like it when you bend forward. We want you to stay upright and level. Well, if I bend forward, your inner ear freaks out and says, whoa, we can't stay upright. We can't keep you in balance then. It's going to lock down tissue. It's going to send a signal to all of your posterior chain to pull you back upright because it doesn't like it when you move forward. Those are the people that will have a hard time bending forward and touching their toes. So a lot of times hamstring flexibility is governed by neurological threat. So part of making that leg press more accessible in the future for me might be that I need to address why I have hamstring flexibility issues. And part of the reason I might have hamstring flexibility issues might be related to perhaps an inner ear issue 
maybe stemming from a car wreck that I was in. Maybe I had a concussion in wrestling when I was younger. And as a result, my inner ear is firing differently than it should. And that could then cause my brain to sense that gravity is more dangerous than it really is. So I might need to rehab th- some of the injuries I had from the past before my brain says, oh, yeah, it's actually safe to bend over. Let's go ahead and let you do that now. But if I never address that, I'll be struggling, wondering why I can't progress in deadlifts and you're over there crushing three, four, five plates. Yeah. It sounds to me like you guys kind of take an antithetical, anti, antithetical, I think, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, approach to modern physical therapy where if we were to look at like a traditional, more phys- physical therapy approach, you would look kind of above and below the hamstrings like, okay, what's the knee doing? Why can't it bend there? What's the calf doing maybe? What's the hip doing? But you guys are looking more at a neurological level as to why that hamstring is not allowing it to relax for you to get into that position, correct? Yeah, that would be a good way to put it. And uh, one of the main issues that we will look at within a traditional physical therapy paradigm is that a lot of injuries and a lot of treatment protocols are exactly that, they're protocols. And this is where the repeat model of nutrition fits hand in glove with what we do. Because if we apply protocols to nutrition, we see a lot of problems there. And that was one of the big things that Ray Pete was adamant about, was that nutrition and health is not a protocol-based checklist that people follow. Oh, well, I drink orange juice. I drink milk. I eat collagen. I therefore am healthy. Well, maybe, but maybe not. Maybe there's other things at play that we need to heal and repair, and there's other things at play with your metabolism that we need to address to get you to a point of being able to thrive in the environment that you're living in. Well, the same thing applies to your movement and your training. If we look at your movement and your training and say, oh, well, you have an MCL injury. You have an ACL rehab. We have to put you in the ACL rehab protocol. Maybe you'll get better, but maybe you won't. And if you don't get better from that, or if the process to get there is so excruciating and so unbearable, then there's something missing. And if you don't look at it through the neurological lens to say, what are all the systems at play with govern, which govern the movement and control of that joint area, of that body area, then I'm going to leave a lot of real estate on the table if I think purely structural. So you mentioned the inner ear. Is that one of the more common examples that you see limiting people? Uh, it can be. I would say the inner ear is definitely within that. Uh, I would say of... All the things that can limit people, we have probably five things that are going to affect movement the most. You have your ability to actually move the joint itself, the motor control side of it. This is, do you know how to actually move your neck? If you have a joint in your body, if you can't move that joint, then the motor control of that joint isn't as clean as it could be, which means when your brain is looking at your options for dealing with the world, Well, it's going to default to what it knows how to do. And if it doesn't know how to move something, then you get the movement you get. So then you have, so you have the motor control side of things. Vision matters quite a bit. If you can't see well, that will be a big issue for movement as well. So for example, you're shooting a basketball. If you can't actually get your eyes to move accurately to the distance of the hoop, you might consistently undershoot the basketball. Or you might consistently overshoot the basketball depending on how accurately your eyes can gauge distance. You have the inner ear, which is going to affect your balance system. So say I'm a pitcher and I'm throwing a baseball. Well, if I can't maintain balance afterwards on that follow through, I might be throwing really, really hard and still not getting the speed I want because I'm not throwing on a stable platform. So your balance matters quite a bit. Breathing is a big component of how you actually move well. Because if I can't breathe appropriately, then I'm not actually able to fuel my cells appropriately. So then from an energetic standpoint, I have issues with energy in the muscle, but I also have issues with the energy in the brain. And that's where I then run into the issues of my fatigue, my brain fog, my ability to stay focused on the task I'm trying to perform. That can be a problem if I don't have good energy to the brain. And breathing is a big part of that. And then finally, you have the integration piece taking all of these different systems that are working and your brain's ability to take all that information and put it together accurately 
to get a good, clean model of how the world works. Because it's one thing to say, oh, your eyes work. Oh, your inner ear works. Oh, your joints are working. But if your brain is like, but I don't know how to integrate all of those together, you might still have problems. So Mm -hmm. a lot of it is, can I organize the nervous system and the information that's coming through it in an appropriate manner for the task at hand? If that task is leg press, that's one thing. But the more complex the task becomes, the more you need all of that integration to work well. So let's take leg press. You have a stable torso. You're not moving against gravity. You're moving the plate up and down. The leg joints are pretty much the only thing moving. Now let's put you in a barbell squat. Well, now you're moving a little bit differently. You actually are moving against gravity. So now your visual system is more heavily involved. Now your inner ear is more heavily involved. So the task becomes different, even though the muscle groups are more or less the same. So that little bit of change in complexity, somebody might thrive at leg press and suffer at uh, barbell squats because they're not organizing that information differently or uh, appropriately for that task. Mm -hmm. The way I'm kind of visualizing this is that you have, you're kind of trying to mesh the outside world with the inside world. So you have your balance, your ability to interact with the earth and, you know, not fall, (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, your eyes, ability to see, you know, where to put your feet and things like that. So again, you kind of are interacting with the outside world. And then what is it? Uh, Kinesthesia or no, proprioception, your ability to feel your body in space, the Mm -hmm. integration of all those concepts together. And if something is not correct there, then you're going to see some movement li- limitations. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's a great way to think about it. So you have the, uh, what we would call the proprioception, which is that sense of where you are in space. You have the equilibrio, uh, equilibrioception, which is your sense of balance and gravity, which in part relies on proprioception, but it's also integrating the visual and the inner ear. You also have the interoception, which is all of the internal workings of the body. This is the sense of, say, things like hunger, your sense of blood pressure change, your sense of heart rate. If you ever have had that situation where your heart is just beating through your chest and you're aware of it, that is your interoceptive awareness. And then you have your exteroception. This is all the stuff happening outside the body. So this is like, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? This is all the stuff outside. All of that together all the time is happening. So right now, your sense of smell, even if you don't have any lovely scented candles going in the background, maybe you do, I don't know. But if you've got anything like that that comes up and you're like, wait a minute, I smell smoke. That is your brain constantly monitoring all of these different inputs, all of these different signals, all of these different systems all the time to determine safety. So if something happens and you start to smell smoke, your brain picks that up and says, okay, Alarm bells, time to do something, figure out what's going on. Do you need to leave? Or if you hear something, you say, oh, well, that was just the microwave. My food is ready. Or, oh, that's a fire alarm. I need to get out of the building. Yeah. But your brain is constantly looking for all that, even if you're not consciously aware of it. And right now, your brain is paying attention to the shirt on your left shoulder and how it feels. But you didn't think about it until I just mentioned it. That is true. <laughs> so... Is this in a way related to like the Hans Selye's uh, general adaptation syndrome where you're kind of going to get a fight or flight response where if you are putting yourself in a position that your body recognizes as dangerous because you are trying to push through movement limitation, you're trying to, you know, maybe bend and touch your toes further than you're able to actually touch your toes, you're going to kind of get an adrenal response due to that. Yes, it would be in part from that general adaptation syndrome always triggering that response can actually become a learned response. And so part of this in our world, we're thinking of this as a neuroplastic change. Meaning if I fire a neuron, that neuron will get stronger. If I fire it enough times, it gets strong enough that it takes less effort to fire again. Because your brain is very energetically hungry. It is the most selfish organ you have when it comes to fuel usage. And so part of the mechanism to survive is that your brain It's good at firing things that you do often, being able to fire it again so that it doesn't cost as much fuel every time. So if it's starting to learn that every time you bend forward to touch your toes, that it's dangerous, it's going to get good at not letting you touch your toes. 
because it's going to save energy every time it says, oh, you're doing that thing where you bend over again. We don't like that. <laughs> Let's stop you from doing that. As opposed to, oh, you've never done this before. Let's sort through all this information and see what we think about it. So neuroplastic change is happening all the time. And if you're constantly practicing things that are dangerous, your brain gets good at thinking it's dangerous. And so on the other end of that, we want to eventually get you to a point, depending on what it is, some things we want to keep dangerous, but eventually getting you to a point where, oh, that leg press is safe. That deadlift is safe. But how we get there is sometimes we have to do enough other work and some of these other systems to figure out how do we convince the brain that you are actually safe in the world. Okay. And bioenergetics is a big part of that because a lack of fuel is a major survival signal to the brain. And that's a big part of the Hans Selye approach is resource availability versus resource demand. And if the demand of the task at hand is outpacing your resource availability, that's gonna open the door to that stress response. And so if we can convince your brain that there's enough resource availability for the task at hand or that the cost of this uh, task isn't as high, we can now change some of those conversations your brain is having about stress or not stress. So who are the main people that you are working with and what is their goal typically when they come to you? I get a whole gamut of all sorts of, if I'm going to be honest, all sorts of people that have been basically brushed aside by the medical establishment. Because a lot of times our medical system, there's, there's some negatives in the medical system. I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of them. But there are some upsides, too. I don't want to be completely anti-medicine. A lot of people are. But there are some good doctors out there, and there's some good forward-thinking medical practitioners out there. But one of the big problems within our medical system as it currently stands is that things have become very compartmentalized. If you have a gut problem, you go see the gastroenterologist. But he may not link it to a heart issue. But your cardiovascular specialist might find that heart issue but that might not be something that you get referred to because of how your symptoms present. So a lot of times that specialization, which is great for really dialing in and becoming an expert in that particular part of the body, that can sometimes leave people with unanswered questions or answers that aren't accurate. So a lot of times when people go through the system and they don't get what they want, eventually they start trying alternative things and eventually they find people like myself. And so usually what I end up working with with people is people that have come to me with uh, those unanswered questions, people that are still suffering and figuring out what's going on. And that usually is a good time frame to start introducing some of these very anti-authoritarian nutritional concepts and then also giving them the permission to say, you know what, neurologically speaking, and I hate using this term, but it works here, you are a special snowflake. <laughs> because in this world, I'm not a snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I don't like the term. But as far as when it comes to your unique individual response to things, if we don't understand that the nervous system is going to have a huge role in determining whether or not something is safe or unsafe, or how you respond to certain treatments or diets or movement uh, therapies then it's a lot of people are going to do things they think they're supposed to and not get the result they want. So having the conversation that says, no, we can actually go deeper and figure out where you have this shortcoming, where you have this overactive brain area. How do we turn down the things that are really doing the overwork and turn up the things that aren't doing their job? Finding that balance for people is very liberating. It mm -hmm. gives people that sense of freedom to say, you know what? I actually do have hope. So I usually get people that are at that point where they're like, I don't know what else to do. And that um, is that for more physical movement or health in general? Health in general. Health in general. A lot of people know me through the repeat world and through the nutrition side of things. But when we start talking, we start digging into stuff and looking at their history, it can sometimes become very clear that, oh, wait, well, this might explain why you're having a hard time getting the response you want from B3. You're stuck in glycolysis because your brain is stuck in the sympathetic state. So what would you be looking at there? to change that behavior and the, the ability of their brain to, you know, get out of the sympathetic state. First place I always start is history. Looking at somebody's history, looking at the symptoms that they're experiencing. You've heard the expression, I'm sure, success leaves clues. Well, failure leaves clues too. And if we have a failure anywhere in the system, it can give us a clue as to what part of the system is not doing well. 
And how that shows up can be a clue as to where they're having a problem. So I always ask people, what do you want to get out of us working together? What do you want to change in your life? And if someone's like, oh, I want more focus. I want more motivation. I'm going to look at that and say, oh, cool. Well, that's in my mind. I think, oh, well, that's, that's your prefrontal cortex. That's a frontal lobe. thing. That's an area of the brain we can target and strengthen and go after. And then we can start looking at what happens pre, uh, prior to that brain area getting weaker. We can start to figure out, okay, how do we trace this back and figure out where in your history or in your nutrition or in your training are you missing the stimulus you need to actually keep that brain area strong or get it even stronger than it is so you can have the willpower and motivation you need. So it's really just looking at history. And then, of course, there's assessments you can use to figure out how somebody's brainstem is functioning, figure out how somebody's cerebellum is functioning, figure out all these different brain areas to get an idea of what's doing its job and what's not. And then you can start to really individualize things for people. I always tell people, especially parents, if you have kids in contact sports, especially, but in sports in general, it's worth doing a full neurological workup before the season starts and then doing one after too because if you've got a kid who plays football they're getting tackled they're getting hit in the head they're getting whipped around they're getting all sorts of concussions that they probably don't realize are concussions because concussions don't always have to be knocked out to get one if you're seeing these changes in the brain it's worth knowing that because then you can start to rehab that far sooner than letting it become an issue down the road so if i get in a car accident I might two, three, four months later start to have symptoms show up because of damage that occurred prior to that. But if I know that certain things in my life are, well, all things in my life are a reflection of my brain function, and I see certain things start to degrade or diminish in a way I don't want, that's a sign that something's changed in my system. And so if I see that, and I can see that early enough, and I can catch that, then I can start to figure out what's different from my base level neurological assessment. Because then I can start to say, oh, well, I was doing this task really well here, but now when I try that task, I'm not as good at it. So whatever that task is, I need to figure out how do I train that? How do I fix that? And then I can figure out the brain areas associated with that and figure out what I need to do to fix those brain areas. Can you dive into a little bit more the what this base level assessment would look like, but also how you tie that into a given brain area? Yeah, so... One of my favorite quotes is from, I believe it was Frederick Carrick, who, if you aren't familiar, Carrick, Frederick Carrick, he is a functional neurology chiropractor. He is the founder of the Carrick Institute, which is one of the top tier uh, functional neurology training facilities in the world. And he teaches all sorts of in-depth levels of information about uh, chiropractic neurology, basically looking at how your brain affects movement and pain and dysfunctions in the brain, how they show up in the body. And one of his quotes is that gait is a window into your neurological uh, function. And so what you can do is you can start by watching people move. You can start by watching people walk. And depending on how they walk and what their hips are doing, what their arm swing is doing, if they've got a lean, whatever that is, there's all sorts of different things you can look at that will tell you what brain areas are doing their job or not doing their job. So a lot of neurological diseases show up in how people move. So when you start by seeing these conditions starting to show up, even if they're not full-blown diagnosable Parkinson's or dementia, you can see changes in people's movement pattern that would lead you to believe that that's the road that they're on. If you know what to look for, if you know how to catch that soon enough. So gait would be a good starting point. And then, of course, looking at movement and seeing what things they can or can't do. So let's just take, for example, most of the people watching and listening to this are going to be, statistically speaking, right-handed. So if you move your right hand, you're going to use the left side of your brain to make that happen. And if you're going to move your left hand, that comes from the right side of the brain. Now, in our modern world, uh, we live in a right-handed world. Right-handed scissors, right-handed door handles. Everything, for the most part, is right-handed. And so over the course of time, those right-handed people will get really good activation in that left cortex. And so 
Comparatively, their left side of their brain and the movement centers associated on that side of the brain with the right hand of the right side of the body, they're going to be stronger than the movement centers on the left side of the brain or on the right side of the brain, which control the left side of the body. It's a little confusing. So you're going to see a side-to-side -side disparity in brain function just from that already. So what we would want to look at is at what point does that become problematic and at what point is trying to improve that going to improve their movement? So a lot of times it would be as simple as, say I'm right hand, I'm going to press with my left hand and compare that to my right hand. Which one's easier? Oh, well, it's the right side because I'm, I'm right handed. I'm stronger there. Okay, cool. Now, can I change your brain function and then retest that left side to see if it becomes easier? And then whatever I did to change the brain function, making that easier, that would be a sign that that would be an underactive brain area in need of getting more activation. How would you know what brain area that was? I would test all sorts of stuff. It just depends on the person. So it could be that that person needs it. A lot of it. I'm trying to think of the easiest way to say this, because I don't want to necessarily go too far down the neuroanatomical route and confuse people. But uh, in essence, you would look at all of the things that influence this side of the brain. So the right side of the brain controlling the left side of the body, I would look at everything that influences the right side of the brain, the right cortex, and I would see if activating that improved the strength. Because one of the common uh, rules that we have in neurology is that when you activate a brain area, you're also going to activate things around it. And so things that influence movement can be things like maybe your inner ear, maybe your vision, maybe your breathing, maybe sound, maybe applying a sense uh, or a, a scent, like a little essential oil. Mm -hmm. And depending on which nostril I put that in can determine which cortex that goes to. And that could be something that makes you stronger. It could also be that I change the training paradigm. I might say, cool, we're going to train your left side only for the next six weeks. Because we're going to try and really drive up activation in that right cortex because I don't really care about your left cortex right now. We know it's doing its job, but everything we found says that your, left, your right cortex is underactive. We're going to train on that a lot. We're going to do a lot of pressing, a lot of single leg work, a lot of ab stuff on that one side, because that is what points towards, or all of our findings point towards needing more activation there. And when we train that left side of the body and get more activation in that right side, over time we create neuroplastic change. Which then means when we go back and we check right side versus left side, the left side should feel just as good as the right. Okay. And then, so let's take the leg press example. Because I don't think people are coming to you and saying, Brian, I, don't, I feel unsafe in the leg press. Like, what do I got to do here? Right. That's but, not their language they use, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so what are you looking for for someone to say, like, Obviously, they're not going to say, I feel unsafe here. It's, you know, a pretty structured position. They're sitting down and then you compare it to like a squat or something where people might feel unsafe. What do you kind of, what do they tell you that you're like, okay, you might be, let's look into this a little bit deeper. So usually I'm looking at pain. Pain primarily is the number one complaint people have. Pain is one of those that people are very aware of. Pain is something that people often will not shy away from discussing or talking about. And it's one of those things, too. Culturally, we are taught that pain is usually a mechanical fault. Oh, you must have a poor knee position. Maybe. You might have too much strain on your ACL. Maybe. You might have a meniscus tear. Maybe. But when we actually dig into pain research and how the pain science world is actually looking at the experience of pain, what we are seeing now is across the board that pain is now, and this is the universally, well, I shouldn't say universally accepted. There are still some... Uh, antiquated therapists out there that are not accepting these neurological models, but the International Society for Pain Research has decided uh, their definition, their working definition of pain at this point is that pain is an output of the brain. It's not an input. It's an output, meaning it comes from up here. So if we think of pain as an output, then we can start to look at that and say, oh, well, then you're having pain on the leg press then let's influence all of the things in the brain to change the decision that the brain has from making the output. So does that mean that 
pain could be because I, I think you would agree that you know you could just let's say you'd be doing a bicep curl wrong and you don't you just over time your elbow is getting inflamed things like that yeah and so obviously the pain is represented in the brain and that's causing like the pain signaling is from the brain but is that also going to encompass like ghost pain when like someone that loses a limb they just are mm-hmm. also feeling the pain in their arm even though it's not even there anymore right yeah, oh, I have a pain in my foot. Well, you don't have any legs, Lieutenant Dan. So yeah, <laughs> it, you're gonna. That's phantom limb pain. That is a great example of how pain can be an experience that doesn't fit the mechanical model. And I have a friend, unfortunately. It's not unfortunate that I have a friend, but his situation <laughs> is unfortunate in that he has uh, what is called chronic regional pain syndrome. It is a condition in which people have this chronic, persistent pain, and the doctors that he is seeing are convinced that they need to do surgery on cutting the nerves in his amputated leg. He has had over 50 surgeries now, and they've gone in and cut nerve tissue, hoping that they got the part that's causing the pain because they are stuck in that paradigm of thinking that pain is manifesting from a mechanical source. And... Unfortunately, he's stuck in that thought process as well. And so he's going to continue down that route. And it's sad to see that he has had to have so many surgeries and so much downtime and so much of his leg continually being removed and removed and removed, trying to chase the pain. When the reality is, well, you had trauma to your brain. Because when you cut a leg off, now the map that your brain had for what the leg consisted of before, it's no longer there. Your brain is confused about how the world works now because it went through your whole life thinking you had two legs and now it's like, wait, we don't have one. So all of this real estate up here that's dedicated towards figuring out where the leg is, it's now not knowing what to do. And then that creates that sense of unsafe, that sense of threat. And so then as a result, it's trying to create pain to get you to not move in a world it can't properly predict. Okay. I think I'm putting up, picking up what you're putting down. So can you give a specific example though? So you mentioned motivation earlier and the cerebellum. So let's say I'm lacking motivation. Um, Maybe there's some form of movement pattern that you can see in my gait cycle that tells you, that indicates to you it might be a cerebellum issue. What are we doing there to maybe improve that? So the motivation piece is primarily uh, cerebellum could play into it, but technically motivation is pretty much ascribed to an area of the brain called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Just to be clear, in case okay. there's any other neuroanatomists watching and they're like, oh, no, no. But the, motive, uh, but the cerebellum itself does have a huge role in movement and a huge role in regulation of emotion and, a huge, and all of that in and of itself can influence motivation. So here's how. From a movement standpoint, one of the main jobs of the cerebellum is to stop unwanted movement. Okay, so the best example is I've got my Red Bull can here. I'm going to reach out for my Red Bull can, but I knock it over. I did not stop the unwanted movement. My hand went too far too fast. There was an error in the coordination of that movement. So the cerebellum's job is to stop that error from happening. So in terms of emotional regulation, you can think of having an aberrant emotional response as something the cerebellum should stop as well. Cerebellum should, if it's doing its job and if it's healthy and if it's strong enough, it should be able to keep your thought process and your emotional response to the life you're living on track. Meaning if somebody at your meeting gives you a deadline, you don't freak out all of a sudden, say, oh, this is ridiculous and I'm going to tip the table over and I'm going to storm out of the room. Well, that's a pretty big egregious response to just say, hey, we need to have this done by the end of the week. So emotional regulation, movement regulation, those are jobs of the cerebellum. So in order to train the cerebellum, we want to include more complex movement. We look at traditional fitness movement patterns. You got your sagittal plane, your frontal plane, and your transverse plane. Most of the movements you'll see in a traditional fitness setting are straight lines. But life is very seldomly going to occur in a straight line. 
So if you want to see that in real time, just go look at jujitsu or wrestling or a lot of martial arts where you're contorted and you're moving and you're in all sorts of weird non-linear positions. Cerebellum involvement is going to be upregulated the more complex the movement. So if I saw that in your gait and I said, oh, Tyler, you've got a cerebellum pattern in your walk, I would want to then increase the complexity of your movement pattern to increase the activation of your cerebellum. Mm. Does that mean, let's say, I'm just a meathead at the end of the day. (laughs) I I like to lift weights. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I also... I I love it too. (laughs) (laughs) I've practiced jiu-jitsu for a number of years too, but let's say... Um, you know, you might say, all right, Tyler, like uh, you can keep lifting weights or maybe you have to dial it back for a little bit of time, but we need you to, to go pick up a hobby, so, you know, so te- some tennis, some jujitsu, something where you're actually moving your body in a more complicated manner in space just to, you know, knock on that cell, cell, cerebellum's door a little bit hit, and get it to wake up a little bit. Yeah. So it could be as simple as just go pick up a hobby. It could also be that when we're in the gym, that we change some of the things that you're doing for that side. It could be that um, instead of always doing like a traditional shoulder press, we start doing more Arnold presses. That's going to be a little bit more complex. It could be that we start to change where you have to land on your lunge. Instead of always doing a walking lunge forward, we start changing the target of where your foot is going. Could be a number of those uh, kind of things too. Because that just upregulates the amount of cognitive task involved with what you're doing, which then increases the overall exposure to complexity that your brain has to deal with. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to ask a question. And I think it's easy for us to think about that, like a bench press is a very non complicated movement after you've learned it for a couple of years. But I would kind of make the argument that, you you know, you have uh, Ronnie Coleman. He's going for his, you know, I saw a video of him yesterday actually doing 200 pound dumbbell Baby. benches. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, 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 buddy. Um, <laughs> it, I mean, that's like, even from a neurological perspective, like you have to be perfect to be able to do that. So that's, I would still say it's a very complicated movement, but would you differentiate that between being a not so integrated movement? Because proportionally very little of his body is involved. So where I would start to draw the line is not so much on the movement itself, but on the individual's response. So if for his cerebellum, that was an adequate amount of load, an adequate amount of activation, then we're good. We don't have to go anything above and beyond that. But if you came to me being able to do that and still showed a cerebellum problem, that's when I would say, oh, well, we need to do something further for you. Okay. All right, so I just want to ask this random question. Duck feet, what does that typically say to you? So duck feet, uh, you're talking about the feet out? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so usually what that implies is a brainstem issue, an underactive brainstem. And so when we see that, what often happens, and you usually will see it on one side more than the other, on the side that's out is usually the side that has the underactive brainstem. Okay. So then we would look at, okay, I need to train that brainstem. And there's lots of ways to do that. There's lots of ways. The brainstem is, the brainstem is you best thought of not just as the housing of all of your cranial nerves, but it's also um, heavily involved in reflexes, heavily involved in a lot of your reflexive strength, reflexive stability, balance, things like that. And so then you can start to look at, all right, well, maybe if I have a, my right foot is out, we're going to say right side brainstem issue, then I can look at a lot of things that can influence the need for stability on that side. So I might start doing stuff with bands. I might start, if you were doing shoulder presses, I might walk up and start slapping you to try and get you to move and have to keep your balance a little bit better. There'd be a lot of things that we could do to drive some of those reflexive things. But it's hard to sometimes do that on your own because Part of what makes things reflexive is that you have to respond to them on a subconscious level, just like you can't consciously tickle yourself. I actually can. Schizophrenic <laughs> can, so you might be schizophrenic. Okay, good, good. <laughs> but I do that already. But <laughs> so because you can predict it, you can get in there and say, "I know this is coming." But if somebody else gets in there, you're like, "Oh, that's awful." But it's one of those things where 
your predictive capacity changes the activation of the reflex. And that's where it becomes a bit of a challenge. So okay. that's where you need somebody that knows what they're doing to be there with you to make it less predictable. Mm -hmm. So let's say we don't have Brian training us with, you know, looking at our gate, assessing us. What can the average person do to just kind of light some of those brain stems, those areas that we're not using enough on? Like, is it just kind of movement diversity, having different hobbies, training different patterns? A lot of it is movement diversity. So Daniel Wolpert, he's a neuroscientist. I think he's out of MIT. Forget where he's at. Uh, but he has a quote in which he says something to the effect of the main role of the brain is movement. And so when we talk about vision, we talk about talking, we talk about hearing, smell, again, using these ideas of you smell smoke, that is to elicit a movement response. Is this danger? Is this not danger? What you hear? Oh, there's something rustling in the bushes over there. Is it a rabbit I can go trap and eat? Or is it a tiger and I need to run away? Eventually, every sensory input is to help you make a decision about movement. So when it comes to the number one way for anybody to improve these things without even knowing what they're doing, without even assessing how their brain is functioning, movement will cover a lot of ground. And so if you're not exercising regularly, you need to start. Not just from the standpoint of all the cardiovascular benefits and from building muscle and hormone function and all of the metabolic benefits, but from the neurological side of things too. Because your brain wants to be able to navigate the world. And if you're not capable of doing that, the brain's not going to feel safe. So movement is the number one thing you can do to improve your brain function. So in contrast to movement, and I think everyone, hopefully everyone that is listening to this knows that you should be, I like to go for a couple walks every day, just like after a meal. I like to work out. I think you do as well. And, you know, have some hobbies. Like I like to snowboard, ski, whatever. What do you like to do on your free time besides lift? Uh, me, I, I'm big into martial arts and combatives. I okay. enjoy doing violent things to people. Nice. Me, me too. <laughs> uh, uh, um, but so how would you compare that to learning a new skill, like playing chess? Yeah. So every time you're learning a new skill, there is, again, going to be some neuroplastic changes that occur. Your brain is now taking something it's not familiar with and creating a predictive model of the world that includes this new skill, this new thing, be it chess be it a martial art, be it skiing. And so of all of the tasks that are involved with that, or all of the neurological pieces involved with that task, your brain is looking at building a map of what's going to happen. So if I'm playing chess, I'm not moving a whole lot. So I'm sitting there and I've got my hand on my chin. And, oh, I'm going to pick this up and move it there. There's not a huge amount of movement skill involved. There's a little bit of, of precision in there. So you could say, oh, hey, there's some cerebellum activation. But compare that to, say, skiing. Well, now there's a lot more risk, a lot more danger, a greater degree of velocity, a greater degree of movement against gravity. And then you also have a lot more full body coordination. But they're more or less the same thing as far as your brain is now taking something and learning how to do it and getting good at what it practices. So across the board, whatever skill you adopt, you're going to get good at what you practice. And so that's why it's super important. Uh, one of the sayings we often use in the combatives world is that be careful what you practice because you might get good at the wrong thing. And so what that refers to in our world in personal safety is that if you're constantly practicing very complex movements, very complex martial arts, you've got a lot of Jeet Kune Do and Sila and a lot of really fantastic movements when you see real violence unfold, real violence is not going to give you the opportunity for a complex motor path. And so if you're practicing things all the time with a compliant partner who's going to let you always get that right wrist lock or always get that throw or always get the uh, appropriate position, a real bad guy is not going to give you that. So you need to be practicing your personal safety in the context of there has to be some stress involved. There has to be a non-compliant person trying to hurt you back. And so if there's not that element in that training, then you're not actually practicing a real scenario. So the same thing would apply to any skill is that eventually you're going to have to, in that chess game, play against a real person. Eventually, when you go skiing, you're going to have to 
go down the mountain. You can't just stand on flat ground and say, oh yeah, I'm doing the thing. I, I'm practicing the movements. No, you're actually eventually going to have to do the real thing. And that's where you're going to really build the best neuroplastic change. Is there any time where you would assess someone and say, you actually need to learn something that's more cognitive in nature and less in yeah. terms of movement? Yeah. And again, that would be depending on the person's history, depending on their goals. If there was signs that I could say, yeah, this person's frontal lobe is definitely underactive. Uh, that would be where I would start to say, we need to drive more frontal lobe activation by learning something very cognitive, by learning something that is more chess oriented, by learning something like, uh, what's the other one? Othello, or what's the one with the black and white uh, stones? There's, there's a, there's a lot of those games that are very, yeah, like, okay. very processing oriented, very strategy oriented. Poker or something like that. Yeah. You have to pay attention to all of these pieces. Um, that would be a good one. Uh, but those kind of activations, you can think of as, oh, they're fun. They're enjoyable. I have a great time when I play them. It could also be that you're having a great time when you play them because you're giving your brain the therapy it needs without, real, without realizing it. Is that you're yeah. drawn to chess because it's therapeutic. You're drawn to poker because it's therapeutic for your frontal lobe. And so in those situations, this is one of the reasons I don't like the idea of dopamine addiction being this big talking point people have. Oh, we got to get rid of dopamine. You have too much dopamine. You're addicted to all this. What if that dopamine is the reward response for you giving your brain the stimulus it needed? Well, why would I want you to avoid that? But even in their argument, they're agreeing with that, right? But they're saying that we're getting too much of the dopamine, like we're doing too many things that we're rewarded for? Perhaps. But in our modern world, if we don't have a lot of movement, we don't have to, I'm, I hate to use the ancestral argument because I think there's a lot of flaws in the ancestral model of health and whatnot. But if we're not hunting and foraging for our food, we're not walking 20 miles a day like the Maasai, if we're not doing all that stuff, then the movement activation that we would normally stumble into by happenstance, if that's not occurring, then we need to create activation in other ways. And so if we're not getting it from a gross amount of activation, we're making up for it with precise movement or precise activation elsewhere. So if we take Instagram, for example, social media, I'm, I'm on Instagram as my main social media source, if anyone wants to follow me there. But as far as the way those kind of apps are designed. They're designed to keep you on the app. They're designed to show you the things that you interact with the most. The algorithm is designed to keep you there because then they can give you more ad time and sell more ads and you become a commodity. That's why those apps are free. That can be problematic. But I also think it can be therapeutic too. Because in the one sense, depending on what you follow, of course, obviously there are some issues that you can encounter if you're comparing yourself to other people all the time and getting depression because of how you're looking at your own personal status in the world relative to these airbrushed models on Instagram. But as far as say from a visual sense, maybe your visual system needs more up close look or up close activation. So if I'm on my phone, my eyes are going to be pulled in into what's called convergence. And that's going to be an activation for primarily for, uh, some of your cranial nerves in an area of your brainstem called the mesencephalon. And if those brain areas are underactive and they need more activation, then being on your phone could be therapeutic. So you might have some subconsciously found a way to give your brain the activation it needed. Now, does that mean that's the healthiest means to do that? Or should you be playing Sudoku instead or maybe something else? Perhaps. But being up, looking up close, that might actually be beneficial for you. One of the big things uh, you'll hear people talk about, I haven't heard it re recently, but for a while there, the big talk was, oh, video games are bad for kids. And okay, well, why? Oh, well, because it's not how things are supposed to be. And this is how we did it when I was a kid. And we need to get on their bike and ride around more. Do you trust your kid riding around on these streets right now in this modern world? I don't, I wouldn't. I don't have a kid, but I wouldn't trust them running around right now alone. But in terms of video games, they're actually now using video games to help train Air Force pilots. And they're actually using video games to increase reaction time and cognitive processing under stress. 
So when we actually look at how certain things create activation, sometimes people are drawn to the things that other people might deem as being a vice or being detrimental to their health, but to that person, and it might be their therapy on a very tangible level of saying the activation you get from playing World of Warcraft or whatever it is might actually be really good for your brain. Have you heard this quote from Sapolsky, uh, Dr. Robert Sapolsky? Dopamine is not about the happiness of pursuit. It is about the happy. Sorry. Dopamine is not about the pursuit of happiness. It is about the happiness of pursuit. I have not heard that exact quote, but that does sound very Sapolsky esque. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because it's like, it, it just kind of flips everyone's head because it's like, it's not about the reward, it's about the pursuit of the reward. Right. Yeah. And so one of the, um, one of the big things when they look at the dopamine levels of winning a competition versus training for the competition, you have higher dopamine when you're actually training for it than when you actually win. It is the pursuit. It is the anticipation, is the excitement of what could be that raises the dopamine. And then when you win, you're like, oh, that's great. I can still get this dopamine rush, but it flatlines after that. Mm -hmm. But that pursuit is such a big part of it. Chris Williamson, who's my favorite podcaster, he's where I got that quote from too, from Sapolsky. And he, he's, he gives this great example where the CEO, if they plan for months to get away to this, you know, tropical vacation and they finally get there and, you know, he pours his martini and him and his wife are sitting with their kid overlooking their beautiful view and said, wow, this is amazing. Wouldn't it be great to do this next year too? And it's like, bro, you just got here. Like, like we are so wired to pursue things. Things mm -hmm. that it's almost, I think it's a challenge for people to oh, it take in the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is it, that something you see a lot with your clients as well? It, it is, and it's one of the things I often try to talk to people about when it comes to nutrition and metabolism. So I always tell people that. Your thought process, your ability to see the world as you see it now will change because the person you are will also change. And if we are looking at the world through the current lens that we're looking at it through, and that lens is shaped by a less than ideal metabolism, as our health improves, it changes the activation of the brain. It changes the neuroplasticity that we're going to experience, and it changes how all of our brain is now then going to predict the world and then respond to the world. And so as we improve your health, that changes the options you see for yourself in the future. But you may not see those options yet because we haven't created the change. And so it's very tempting for people to say, I just want to feel better. Whatever nebulous definition of that that is for them, once you get there, then what? You're not done. You're still alive. Mm -hmm. But then what do you want to do with, at that point? Yeah. Because then we can start to say, oh, well, now you have the option to go to the gym. You didn't have that before. You didn't even think it was a thing. You were just like, I just want to be able to get off the couch and not be low on energy. Cool. We can start with that. But then eventually you're going to have different choices. to make. And then you start going to the gym and say, all right, now I'm going to the gym. I'm stronger. I got better tissue density. I got better ligament disconnectivity in my joints. It's easier and safer for me to move, maybe I should try and run a marathon. Not that I would ever recommend that for somebody. I think it's the, probably one of the worst things you could do for your health. But if that's your thing, cool. But I'm going to help you do it because that's you and I'm not going to tell you what to want or not want. I'm just going to tell you how to mitigate the damage. But from that standpoint, you might not have even thought that was a possibility until you were healthy enough to have that thought. So the person you are is going to change all the time. So this, this pursuit idea, this idea of always wanting the next thing, that thought process is built on who you are right now. But as we improve your health, as we improve your thyroid, and we improve how your liver functions, and we improve how your gut is functioning, all of these pieces start to fall in place, well, then you're going to see a world differently than you currently do. You're going to see options differently than you can. So it's very tempting to want to say, I know exactly what the world is now, and my, my view of the world is correct at this moment. You're seeing the world through your current lens, and that lens will change depending on your health.
I think it's Heraclides quotes. Like, a man can never step in the river twice because it's not the same river and he's not the same man. Bingo. Exactly. Profound way to think about it, for mm-hmm. sure. So uh, taking a step back into off our heavenly above Eagle Eye view, um, we talked a lot about movement and changing your movement patterns. How do you see the integration of diet and nutrition with these ideas? So from a movement standpoint, from a neurological standpoint, again, the goal is neuroplastic change. I want to find the things in your brain that need to be activated and strengthened, and I want to strengthen them. I want to find the things that we need to maintain and maintain them. And I want to find the things that are overactive and make them less active. All of that is neuroplastic change. The rate of that change is limited by your metabolism. So if I have a healthy bioenergetic underpinning to all of the activation I'm trying to create, I've got good carbohydrate sources. I've got good sugar availability. I've got everything dialed in. I've got low amount of PUFA, so I don't have a ton of lipofuscin accumulating in my brain. I don't have too much iron creating lipofuscin in the brain. If I have all of these pieces in place from, from a brain health standpoint, then that allows my brain to create the change that I'm trying to train it to create much more readily. One of the biggest problems I see with people is that we do a certain task neurologically and they don't get the change to stick. And part of that is either because we didn't do the right task, I'll put that on me, we haven't found the right thing yet, or we haven't found the right dosage, or metabolically, even if we can create the activation, you can't yet do enough work to fire that neuron enough to create the change in the neuronal structure that we're trying to create. You might only have one or two good reps in you metabolically before your system tanks, and you get exhausted and you get wiped out. It happens. So then we have to go after metabolism before you can even be healthy enough to do the training you need to do to become healthy enough to be the person you want to be. Mm. And so for you, where does that start? Usually it depends on the goal, depends on the person and what they're looking at. Because I'll get some people that they don't even know that the brain exists as far as an option to be trained and affecting their health. They come in saying, I have sleep issues. Help me with my sleep. Or I have back pain. Help me with my back. Or I have low thyroid. My doctor said I have low thyroid. I want to fix that. Or I have hormone issues, whatever it might be. People oftentimes don't realize that there's other things at play. And I usually don't introduce that until when we're starting to address things nutritionally and figuring out, okay, the response you had to this supplement change or this nutritional change isn't common. It isn't what I would expect. Then we would start to say, all right, let's look at other things. So Usually, if they're coming to me for nutrition or nutrition-related expectations, we start there. And then if we don't see the changes we want, then we look at other stuff. Have you ever heard of PRI? Postural Restoration Institute? Yeah. Yeah. So how does... So I'll just summarize it for the audience. I've dug a little bit into them. Or I took... So I was certified with... I don't know if you know Connor Harris. I took his Mm -hmm. course. And basically their philosophy is that Posture kind of regulates a lot our ability to move, and they generally believe it stems from your diaphragm, so your ability to breathe and your rib cage. So that's kind of the most malleable bones where it can change, and then it can start to, you know, you can start to really have a rounded, curved kyphosis sort of posture, a very arched back, and that largely depends on your movement very movement capacity would be a better term. Um, and so the what they would say is the quintessential piece is your ability to balance yourself with gravity. If you ever look at someone from the side or from in front, they're going to be about 50, 50, even if they're really hunched over their uh, ass is going to be sticking really far back because as, if you weren't balanced with gravity, you would just fall over. How does your view differ from more of a, I guess, structural and breath sort of work, which you did mention the breath as well to taking a more neurological approach. Yeah, so there's not necessarily anything there that I would say is wrong. I would, if anything, say it's incomplete. So somebody has a breathing issue. Their diaphragm is causing excess tension. For those that aren't familiar with diaphragm anatomy, it's basically this umbrella-like muscle that sits at the bottom of your ribcage. And there's a central tendon that runs down along the anterior part of the lumbar spine. So rigidity of that tendon might affect your lower back tension. 
the tension of the muscle itself and the coordination of that muscle itself can determine how big of a breath you take, which can affect ribcage positioning. The diaphragm is innervated by a nerve called the phrenic nerve, which lives in C3, 4, and 5. The analogy that they teach you in med school is C3, 4, 5 keeps the diaphragm alive. Okay. And so you might have a cervical spine issue impacting that phrenic nerve, causing those breathing issues. So, okay, maybe I have a breathing issue causing this postural problem. Well, maybe I have a cervical spine issue. Well, maybe I have a cervical spine issue because I have an inner ear issue. And your inner ear is heavily involved in coordinating head and neck movement. Maybe I have an eye issue affecting my neck, and that's going to affect the impingement of that phrenic nerve, which affects diaphragm function, which then affects my posture. So depending on how far you go with it and how, far, how many layers deep you get with it, you, you're addressing diaphragm issues might solve things right away. But it might be that you have to go further down that chain to find the root of the problem to then come back to say, okay, now we can actually get what we want out of that diaphragm. Okay. Interesting. So do you ever see physical remedies fix nutritional issues? Like one example you could see or you could draw is that you're seeing a lack of blood flow or oxygenation to a tissue because there's a movement restriction, which is, you know, pinching a nerve or pinching an artery. And now mm-hmm. that you've now, now we uh, fixed your leg press. Mm-hmm. So your, uh, your butt can get some more <laughs> blood flow. Probably yeah. not a realistic example, but and now you can you know adequately uh, oxygenate your pelvis, and now your sacral what is it that everyone has the the nerve running down the sciatic, uh, sciatic nerve. There you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. So edema. So for those that aren't familiar, edema is generally a stagnation of lymphatic fluid around an area of the body. So you'll see this a lot when people don't have properly defined ankles. They have swollen ankles. And so, and you'll see this around different joints all over the body. But one of the main functions of the lymphatic system is to transport immune uh, products. So your macrophages, things like that. Your lymphatic system is also heavily involved in the transport of fat-soluble vitamin. So if you have a stagnant lymphatic system, you might be taking the right vitamin A, D, E, and K, but not getting the effect you want. So by finding where you might have stagnant lymphatic buildup and addressing the lymphatic system through movement or through breathing or other means, you can start to change how people respond to the nutrition that they're getting because now you're actually getting the appropriate transport of immune function and fat-soluble vitamins through the body by improving how somebody's moving. Yeah, that's fascinating. It makes sense too. It's just, it's hard to like think about those examples where it's like, oh, that actually could help that. Mm -hmm. It's not direct at least. It's not direct. And this is again, back to the idea of why a lot of people will become disenfranchised with their medical practitioners because their doctor might be so stuck in a certain paradigm that seeing other things that are not within that, oh, you've got this condition, you've got this disease these are the things we know about this disease. Instead of looking at these bigger pictures, well, if we can improve how well you're utilizing vitamin E, well, that might affect some of your dysmenorrhea. That might affect some of your thyroid function. That might affect some of your blood sugar regulation issues. All by getting you to move differently and affecting fat-soluble vitamin transport. Mm -hmm. But that's not something a doctor is necessarily going to have time to see, uh, teach you or show you because the average time that you see a doctor over the course of a year is about five minutes. <laughs> Which is crazy <laughs> to think about. But, not a yeah. lot you can teach people about behavior change and lifestyle change in five minutes. No. Other than maybe eat your vegetables and fruit. <laughs> yeah. Eat your fruit and vegetables and your, just follow the my plate plan and uh, take your meds and you'll be fine. Yep. Exactly. So what are your overarching principles for maintaining a healthy brain and movement pattern? I guess those two are very interrelated, but so what are your big things, the principles that you need or you want to see someone integrate into their life, maybe as part of their daily routine or maybe just, you know, on a week or monthly basis? So I think the big thing, if this would be the number one thing of anything movement related, brain training related, even nutrition related for that matter, is find something you enjoy. If you don't enjoy skiing, I'm not going to tell you to ski. 
If I did, you're not going to stick with it. But if you're like, but I really like tennis, Brian. Cool. Then play tennis. You got to ski. <laughs> you got to ski. There's no way around it. Skiing is the only way. <laughs> uh, so if you enjoy something, what happens is not only do you have more behavioral adherence to doing it. So there, right out of the gate, you've got some means of metabolic expenditure, caloric expenditure. You've got some means of moving the body and creating structural changes. You've got some means of brain activation. And then we don't have to work as hard at keeping you going. We can just then do stuff around that to make sure that you can persist with it. Well, I love to play tennis, but it hurts my knees. Cool. Then we need to figure out how to strengthen your knees appropriately. Cool. We're going to make you more resilient for the things you love. But if I say, oh, I don't care what you enjoy. But you need to go to the gym and you need to back squat and you need to deadlift and you need to do overhead presses and you need to do this FMS routine and you could do overhead squat on this sterile piece of plastic and this PVC pipe. All of these things that people say you should do, but you don't enjoy any of it. Well, then what happens intuitively is A, you're not going to stick with it, but B, you're going to have a certain internal metabolic resentment to do that. And what, by that, what I mean is your system is going to create the feedback that says, we don't want to do this. And you'll have an increase in blood pressure, an increase in heart rate, an increase in anxiety. It'll draw on your resources. So back to that Hans Selye model of stress, you've now created an environment internally, as well as through the external activations that you're creating that you don't enjoy. You've now created a situation in which your body is now opening that door to a stress response. And so as that persists, as your body is constantly fighting against these things you were told to do, like me when I was doing my low carb stuff, everyone told me to do it in spite of all the evidence that my body was giving me to the contrary, you're going to eventually start to create more wear and tear than it's worth. And that opens the door to major problems. But if you're doing something you enjoy, even if it is more physically demanding, it's less costly to your body in some way. Wouldn't you say at some point, though, that most things that people start doing, they're going to suck at and they kind of kind of hate? Like, I'm sure when you first started a new martial arts or when I first mm -hmm. started jiu-jitsu, I was like, I hate this. Like, it stinks. Like, I'm just getting my ass beat or snowboarding, whatever it is that you kind of have to go through the stress just to see maybe over the rainbow, you'll like it and you'll start enjoying it and you'll find love with it. but you would probably agree you don't want to just spend your whole day, you know, playing video games, even though it could be fun. Could be fun. Yeah. And that's, again, I'm going to always come back to, well, does that give us the activation that we want? Does that show up in an improvement in your brain function? And if it does, I'm not going to argue with you. If it doesn't, and it's coming at a cost of the goal you have or the cost of the brain function we need to get you to have, then we might have to have a conversation about how much time you're spending in front of the video games. But as far as that initial, I'm new at this, I'm going to suck at this, I think a big part of the problem with that is people oftentimes aren't okay with being a beginner. And if you frame it, one of the big things that helped me think of this, um, from a martial arts standpoint, there's belt system. Everyone starts out at a white belt. Even if you've got a black belt in another system, you start at a white belt in that new system. Everybody is looked at as a beginner. And your progression to the next belt is built on the skill that you develop. But if you look at life that same way and say, I'm always going to be a beginner at something. Every expert was once a beginner at that thing, no matter what it was. I have a keychain that says every black belt is a white belt that never gave up. There you go. Exactly. Mozart wasn't born being a fantastic composer. Now he had a certain situation where his dad was a really good composer and he grew up around music in that realm. But circumstance aside, he still at some point had to practice and play. And so everybody has to start as a beginner somewhere. You had to learn how to crawl before you learned how to walk. Everyone did. And so you're not born, oh, cool, I'm a baby deer. I can run right out of the... No, you're, you're not going to be able to do that. So you have to be okay with failing because through failure becomes, you, you learn through failure, you have the ability to change and adapt. Through failure, you refine your predictive model of what's to be expected in that situation. Every time you go to take a forehand in tennis and you miss, 
eventually you're going to learn how to not take a forehand. Yeah. And if you enjoy what you're doing, the failure becomes a lot easier to tolerate. If you don't enjoy it, but you thought you had to do tennis, that still might not be the thing for you. And that's okay. I would much rather somebody spend five to 10 years exploring different movement modalities. Maybe I'll try Pilates one week. Maybe I'll try yoga. Maybe I'll try pickleball. Maybe I'll try whatever. And you just go through thing after thing after thing after thing until you find something like, oh, I like that. And if you really enjoy it, then the failure becomes less of a problem. But if it's something where you think you have to do it, then that failure becomes a harder ax to uh, grind. For sure. The last question I have for you is that one of the things that I got out of postural restoration is that a lot of times our compensations are our superpowers. So I'll give the example in powerlifting, which is a really easy one. You typically see people with either a really squatty deadlift or a really uh, deadlifty squat. So what I mean by that is like, you'll see some people have a very vertical spine when they're squatting, and then they also have a very vertical spine. And you'll, usually you'll see more sumo style uh, deadlift because they're, you know, they're very quad dominant, let's say. And the other people are very glute and hamstring dominant. So do you see the same thing neurologically where, you know, the chess player might n need to have an overdeveloped, let's say, cerebellum or uh, frontal cortex for that logical thinking? And <clears throat> that superpower, that, you know, overdeveloped, whatever, you know, could be their glutes, it could be a certain part of their brain, probably both, is needed for them to be, to achieve a level of success that they want to achieve. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. If there's one common trend I've seen working with elite level athletes, and then by that, I mean, people that are paid to play their sport, not just people that are hobbyists, but people that are like, no, this is my career. Elite level athletes are master compensators. When you look at them, they are able to perform some amazing human feats. And then when you test them, you're like, how are you alive? How are you able to function in the world? Because some of these brain areas are not working, but a lot of times it's enough of the perfect storm of genetics and anatomy and environment and all the sports they played growing up to get them to that point of being so good at compensation that they found their niche and they stuck with it. And they don't even care about some of these other things in their life whether they realize it's not supposed to be that way or not. So one of my favorite studies, uh, they showed some major league baseball players. I think it was baseball. It was either baseball or uh, basketball. I'm pretty sure it was baseball. They did MRIs of their shoulders, showed them these catastrophic shoulder injuries. And they showed them to some physicians and the, phys or the orthopedic surgeons. They said, 32 out of 33 of these, we would do surgery on right away. They didn't know who the shoulders belonged to. And then they said, oh, these are all major league pitchers currently throwing with that shoulder. They didn't even know that it was a problem. They were just like, no, I'm super awesome, crazy fast pitcher. Their shoulder looks like garbage in there, but they're still functioning. Whereas you or I might be like, oh, I, I tweaked that a little when I slept funny. I need to go get a uh, cortisone shot. No, they're just like out there rocking because their brain has created such a compensatory state. And a lot of it too, I think, is there, there's a psychological aspect in that situation of even if I did get the surgery, it would cost me my downtime and some of my career pay, and I'm not going to do it. So of course, there's a psychological underpinning to how people respond to those kind of situations. But as far as elite athletes are concerned, their brain function matters quite a bit for why they are the way they are and are able to compensate the way they do. Hmm. Would your approach still be the same though? That maybe they, we can need to sprinkle some chess or some tennis into that just to kind of hit those brain areas if they are in pain, if they are seeing those difficulties with their movement? In an elite level athlete? The theoretically, if they come to you and saying, like, I, I, I'm, you know, my shoulder's in pain, I can't pitch anymore, and you, you find that it's a cerebellum issue, I'm just throwing that out again. Sure, sure. Is, the, is the approach going to be the same generally, you think? Like maybe you try and do as little as they possibly need to get the response. But in that situation, yeah, it would still generally be the same. But I would always defer back to I don't want this to come at a cost of their career or their sport. 
So if it's a matter of, I want to get back on the field because I injured my shoulder and I can't currently pitch this season, but I want to be able to pitch next season. Well, my goal is going to be getting them to pitch next season. Even if what I find neurologically is that you've got so much other stuff going on and we actually need to use the other arm and not the one you're good at throwing with. That one, that's going to be a tough conversation to have because it's going to be, look, we can make your brain better or we can make you pitch better. Now, if it's a matter of getting them to be able to pitch, we might accept a higher level of compensation compared to the average person who's just trying to improve their health. And that's why I actually don't enjoy working with athletes, if I'm going to be honest, because uh, elite level athletes, because A, there's usually a less health oriented focus in a lot of times working with those mm -hmm. kind of clients. And secondly, there's oftentimes a huge amount of other people on their team. So they have their own physical therapist, their own chiropractor, their own massage therapist, all these other chefs in the soup, so to speak. And then there's little old me that's saying, no, your eyes matter. <laughs> and <laughs> so it's one of those where I, it can become too stressful in that situation, especially if it's a matter of you're saying something that other people in their team of professionals is disagreeing with or giving them different perspectives on. So it's sometimes hard to create the change that you want to. That, and also, I don't think in, I think a lot of times in society today, we conflate performance with health when a lot of times <laughs> health comes at the cost of performance. And that's exactly why Z Health named itself Z Health. So health, health, performance, because health should always precede performance. That's awesome. And a lot of people mix it up. They say, oh, well, we should do performance first and then we'll pick up the pieces later. And this is why I have such a hard time when people are like, oh, well, exercise is so good for you. Everyone should do it. I'm like, maybe, maybe, depending on the person and the exercise, maybe, mm -hmm. but maybe they're not there yet. Maybe what they really need is somebody to help them work on their gut. Maybe they need to fix their thyroid first before you can even have that conversation. So, all right, here's the last, last question. You have the person that, uh, if you have, to, do you have time? Yeah, I got time. All right, cool. Uh, so you have the person that, ha um, this is, let's say Jordan Peterson, when he was super sick, it, um, he had, according to Michaela, I remember seeing this clip where, you know, he just couldn't get off the couch, basically, like super sick, obviously metabolically very unhealthy. Do you tell that person, like, you know, just go outside and get a couple steps in, walk around the block? Or do you think that's kind of a moot point? Because, you know, th they should have the energy to want to do something if they were a functioning person. It, well, at least he's, mm -hmm. but they're clearly not functioning and it's clearly not like it, his issue was clearly not that he wasn't back squatting enough weight, you know, right. <laughs> that's your real problem, Jordan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. Uh, one of the biggest phrases that gets the most pushback, especially in the Ray Pete world, uh, a friend and mentor of mine, my dear friend, Zachariah, uh, he has this saying that he often uses, which is, if you don't like to exercise, there's something wrong. And people hear that and they immediately latch on to what their vision of exercise is. So that might be, oh, exercise means Pilates. So he just said, if I don't like Pilates, there's something wrong. Or exercise means going to the gym. Or exercise means running. Whatever that is. But it really means is movement. And again, this is back to your brain is needing some sort of activation. It's needing activation that comes from movement because movement is how you survive. You either run to or run from danger. It's a very primal instinct to be able to move. And if you can't move because your brain is creating a lack of motivation towards movement, it's trying to create this non-movement state, then there's something that's underpinning that sort of activation. So then we have to figure out, okay, well, if you don't have the willpower to get off the couch and walk around and do stuff, we have to work with where you're at. We have to figure out what it's going to take with your current framework, your current state of neurological function to improve your brain enough to then get you to the next step. And it might be, okay, you can't get up and walk around yet. Can you do some bag breathing? Mm -hmm. Oh, you can't even do bag breathing. You can't bring yourself to that. Can you close your eyes and imagine doing bag breathing? Because at least that can start to create some sort of activation pattern to lower that threat level. 
then lower the barrier to doing the back breathing. And then we can get you to do the back breathing. And then we can raise your CO2. And then we can improve your metabolism just slightly enough that you can then sit up and go walk around a little bit. Yeah, that's fascinating. It's almost like just because someone physically can move, they have the ability to, doesn't mean they're physiologically ready to move or should be. That's, that's basically depression. So depression, if we think of it as your brain has created a state in which it does not want you interacting with the world. It can create pain as an output to get you to not move. It can also create other states like depression. And if we put depression and pain in that same category as they're both an output, then we can start to look at them the same way and say, there's something missing in your environment, in your life, in your nutrition, in your activation that's giving your brain a sense of safety in the world. And these are natural, normal responses to feeling unsafe in the world. So if we can make your brain feel safe, we can address a lot of these mental health issues and a lot of these movement and pain problems by doing the same thing, by improving how well your brain is working, both metabolically and from an activation standpoint. Wow. Well, that was awesome. Brian, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, is there anything, any last thoughts, closing thoughts? I got nothing, man. That was a lot longer than I thought it'd be. I, I'm, I'm surprised we covered as much as we did. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. I thought it was a great conversation. Um, can you tell everyone where they can find you? Learn some yeah, more? Absolutely. So I'm most active on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram under the uh, sign-on name of Performance Neuro. And you can find me on my website, which is the same name, performanceneuro.com. Awesome. Well, everyone go check that out. And thank you guys for staying tuned. Brian, thank you, thank you again for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And until next time, guys, be good. All right, if you made it this far, thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it and hope you guys found this episode useful. And I really just want to thank Brian again for taking the time. It was an awesome conversation. We'd gone back and forth online a lot. And it was great to finally sit down with him. You can find Brian, as he said, at performanceneuro.com or on Instagram at performanceneuro. And if you guys did enjoy this episode, please make sure to hit that subscribe button or follow button if you're listening as a podcast. It really means a lot. And give us a five-star review. These episodes take a lot of work to get out there, so I really appreciate it. But until next time, guys, be good.